uh, as we are also here together, that we would spend time encouraging one another uh, with whatever's going on in our life. Father, I pray that you would be glorified and magnified in this assembly this morning. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so um, just want to let you know the Family Discipleship Night is coming up. It's the 24th at 6 o'clock. You are all welcome to come. Uh, if you are under the age of 16 and like to run around and play games, we are going to have games. Uh, if you're older than that, you can also run around and play games, but you are going to be a helper and not necessarily the ones running around. Okay, um, but uh, we'd love to have you come. We also have a time of discussion for the adults. Um, this last time we've been talking about, in the last month we've been talking about, God is omnipotent, which means that God is all-powerful. As we've been doing studies specifically on the attributes of God on these, on these monthly discipleship nights. Uh, the memory verse for this month was Isaiah 40, 28, which says this, The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. And so we would love to have you join us again as we discuss another attribute of God on the 24th at 6 p.m. That's a Friday night. Love to have you or the kids or anyone in your household. We'd love to have you come. Um, and slightly of more somber news, you may have heard um, Bear, uh, our dear beloved brother, went home to be with the Lord last week. And so uh, we do have a celebration of life planned for him. Uh, and that's going to be March 25th, uh, directly after the men's breakfast at 1 o'clock. Uh, and so we would love for you all to come. We would love for you all to attend. Um, it's going to be a time of really celebrating his life. Uh, and uh, I remember sitting down with him and talking with him about what are the things that you want to happen here. And he, he gave me a long list. And I told him, I, you know, I, I think we only have like maybe two or three hours. He was like, oh, they'll stay. So <laughs> we, we'll, we'll keep it to a reasonable time. But uh, Bear, Bear was so excited to go home and be with his Lord. And um, so it'll be a great time to celebrate his life and, and really um, what was important to him and what he wanted you to know. Um, so all are welcome on the 25th at 1. Uh, we also have baptism coming up. Um, so Easter Sunday, we are going to have a baptism. Uh, I've been assured that we can set up the baptism here and we can have it all ready. Um, the water will be lukewarm, um, and which according to ancient tradition is wrong. Uh, if you know anything about ancient tradition, it says that the water should always be cold. Um, but we won't do that to you. Um, so <laughs> if you are interested in being baptized, come talk to an elder. Come talk to myself. Talk to Paul. If Ben's here, talk to Ben. Uh, we'd love to talk with you. It's not too late. You've got about another week or two before we would be able to have a cutoff point. So if you're interested or if you're thinking about it or if you're, if you're like, I'm not sure if I'd like to do that again because I feel like maybe I'm in a different place, talk with us. We'd love to talk with you. Um, so we ultimately, the reason why we're doing it on Easter is because we couldn't think of a better way of really celebrating the resurrection than the demonstration of baptism. Uh, and so that's why we chose that particular date. Uh, so... Uh, that's the baptism notice. That's April 9th, which is Easter Sunday. Um, directly before that, uh, Good Friday, April 7th, we will have a Good Friday service. Uh, the time is still TBD, um, but it'll probably be either 6 or 6.30, uh, and it'll be a time where we celebrate uh, the Lord's death, uh, as Sunday we'll be celebrating his resurrection. Uh, the last announcement I have is men's breakfast, which is March 25th. That'll be at 8 o'clock. If you're a guy, you're welcome to attend. Uh, ben probably won't be teaching this time because they have a little one on the way and they probably won't be around. Um, but uh, you'll probably either get me or Paul or somebody will, will come up with something for you, and I'm sure it'll be a good time of discussion and reading the scriptures. Uh, so if you'd like to attend, that's 8 o'clock on the 25th. Uh, any announcements that I missed? Seeing none, I'm going to move forward. Let's go ahead and look at our scripture reading this morning, which is Acts chapter 26. Acts being in your New Testament, it is right after the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. Chapter 26, and then we're going to be reading verses 19 to 26. I'm reading this morning out of the English Standard Version, starting in verse 19 of chapter 26. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, then throughout all the region of Judea, 
and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and the Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being first to rise from the dead, that he would proclaim light to both our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, for I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. May the Lord bless the reading of his word, and may we continue to worship him with song. Well, good morning, church family. It's so good to be with you again. Um, I just shared this morning in Sunday school how much Mike, the kids, and I have missed being with you all, and um, it made me think about how God just puts that desire in our heart to be together, to assemble, um, and he also commands us not to forsake the assembly, and um, it just also made me think about people who are not able to come to church and to events, to fellowship with others, and um, really put on my heart that, you know, we should be making an active effort to visit them um, when they are well, um, um, because we don't know what's going on in their life. They might be injured. They might be recovering from something. um, They might just not be able to physically get here, and um, we just want to make sure that we love the whole church um, and be the church to one another. So if you would rise and join me in singing about our great God, and I really... I'm hoping that this will stir up hope in all of us and remind us of where our hope lies.
John chapter 7, 36 and 38 says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out. He says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the, spirit, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. In Revelation 21, verses 5 and 6, it says, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. In Revelation twenty two seventeen, it says, The Spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price come. The bride is the church, the bride of Christ. It's one body, the church. And what we declare is that Christ is the living water. And what he gives us springs up within us and produces newness. And it's a diverse group of people, (laughs) very different, as we've talked about many times. And we've all, though, been purchased by Christ, given this living water by Christ, and that he then builds that body of Christ in our midst and globally. And so for this reason, and many other reasons, we gather together not only to pray for our body, but also to pray for those other churches in our area who God is using and whose God is is being worshipped in. And so join with me this morning and let's pray for some other churches and some other pastors in our area. Father God, we just want to thank you for the fact that you have given a wide testimony, that you are calling your church, that you are calling people to partake of Christ and gain the living waters. And Father, I thank you for all of the assemblies who are faithfully communicating your word, and and we could spend hours naming the individuals and, and churches and bodies in our local area. But Father, this morning I think of some specific, I think of Pastor James Weathersby, who's who's faithfully serving at Riverview Psychiatric Center. Father, I pray for him this morning, as I know he's delivering the word to those who are there. And Father, I pray you'd be with him. Uh, Give him a a spirit of of truth this morning to declare the truth to those who are around him. Father, I pray for pastors John Jones, Brian Ganong, and Rodrigo Giuliani at Lisbon Falls Baptist Church. Father, I pray that you would just be with them this morning. Help them to, together with the church at Lisbon Falls Baptist, Join in worshiping you and praising you and learning more about you from your word. Pray that you would bless that congregation, make them fruitful and multiply in their region. Father, I pray for Dan Coleman and Jim Portolsky over at Central Church. Father, we pray that you would continue to use Central Church, Father, to communicate the gospel in our area of Central Maine. Father, I pray that you would use the speaking and the preaching of the pastors and the teams that are there, Father, to communicate the message of the gospel. Father, I pray for Pastors Ira Hall and Cody Spencer at Beans Corner Baptist Church. I pray you'd be with, with them as they deliver the word this morning. And I know Cody is picking up majority of that. Pray you'd be with him. Give him uh, your words to speak from your word. Pray you'd be with the congregation there and that they would be continue to be an influence through the work of Camp Berea and also through their work of their local assembly. Father, we pray for Pastor David Fry and Caleb Robinson and Ron Sargent over at Hollis Center Church. And Father, we're, we're connected specifically to David by, by families in our church. And so, Father, I pray you'd be with him. I pray you'd be with that church. I pray you'd be with the teaching ministry there and that you would continue to bless the progress and the growth that they've been seeing. I pray that you would continue to build your church there. Father, I pray for Pastor Jacob Guy and Pastor Ronald Wardman. Uh, Father, two other pastors that we're connected to and, and family to uh, Father, I pray that you would just uh, bless their ministries and their bodies. I pray that you continue to grow their church. Father, I pray whether it be in South uh, Portland or whether it be all the way up in, in um, Father, the, the Winthrop area. Father, I pray you just be with them and their congregations. Pray for Pastor Doug Richards at Calvary, Calvary Bible Baptist Church and Pastor Leo Fenton at Cornerstone Baptist Church. Father, I thank you for all of these men and these bodies that are represented people that are naming the name of Christ. Father, I pray that as they gather this morning to worship, that we would be worshiping you with them in spirit and in truth. Father, knowing that you are calling all to yourself, that you're building your church and that there is one kingdom that you are building for your son, Jesus. 
We pray for all of these people and the individuals that they represent. We ask these things. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. We thank you for joining us. We thank you for praying with us. We need to continually be praying for people in our community who are doing the same thing that we're doing. We're one team, one team. So let's join together as we continue to sing in where we find our satisfaction, where we find our joy, that it's in Christ alone and not in what we are or in what we own.
good. So how many of you are messed up with the time thing? How, how many of you? How many of you are ready to be done with that whole like time shifting thing? Yeah, yeah. Amen, right? Yeah, the hour in the fall is great. It's it's the hour that you the you know that I took advantage of in the fall where I stayed up to have fun that I'm regretting now because I wanted that sleep. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I was trying to convince my whole household this, this last night that it was actually an hour earlier, and, and I, I just couldn't convince everybody. And so, um, you know, we stayed up to the normal time, which it brings, brings about a lot less sleep. Uh, but that's okay, because I'm awake, so you have to stay awake. Right? Is that how it works? Actually, Spurgeon actually made a comment specifically to his class of preachers, and he said that if you put your congregation to sleep, that's your fault. Um, he said you should preach more interesting. Um, so to a certain extent, it's on the preacher. Uh, so if you fall asleep, that's on me, not you. Um, so we're in Acts chapter 25. That's where we're picking up. Uh, and we're in the middle of the chapter, starting in verse 13 of chapter 25. But uh, I just want to bring you back along to where we are because it's important to know what's happened in order to kind of continue where we are. So in our sermon last week, Paul was on trial both by Felix and Festus after being mobbed by the Jews. And um, he was on trial ultimately at the request of the Jewish leaders. Uh, both of these men were governors in the province of Syria, where Israel is, um, and Felix, upon hearing of the case of Paul from Lysias, which is the tribunal from Jerusalem, he knew right away that Paul was innocent of the things that the Jewish leaders were ultimately accusing him of, and he postponed his decision of the case in order to please the Jews, and that's what we saw last week. He, he waited. He's like, well, the Jews are unhappy with this guy. I'll just keep him in custody uh, to make them happy. Um, ultimately, he did that because to the date, as much as the Jews said in their trial with him that they really thought he was excellent, they really didn't think he was excellent. They actually hated him. And so he was trying to do something to appease them. So he kept Paul. And we also saw that he kept Paul specifically that he might get some money from him. Uh, because he heard that Paul had brought some money for the poor down to Jerusalem, and he kept bringing him and summoning him to him so that he might, you know, grease a little bit of his palm to let him on his way. Paul, of course, did not do that, and that's specifically what we see in verses 24 through 26. Well, what's interesting is, is that Paul had the opportunity over and over and over again with Felix to communicate the gospel, and that's exactly what he did, according to verses 24 through 26 of chapter 24. So we see that at the end of chapter 24, two years elapsed where he was in Caesarea. And so he is staying in Caesarea, awaiting to go to Rome because Jesus said, you must also testify to me in Rome. And so Paul's waiting, and he, I'm sure we talked about this last week. He must have gotten to the point where he's like, okay, God, when are you going to do this? You said you're going to do this, but when are you going to do it? It's been two years. And then uh, we began chapter 25 last week, and, and Festus comes on the scene. He's the new governor, and he's basically only there for a few days before the Jews start bugging him about Paul and about trying to kill Paul. Uh, they've been pretty consistent about it since the beginning. And so um, they, they begin this kind of, you know, we need to try him and, and you need to do what basically what Felix didn't do before. And so Felix comes in, uh, leaves as the governor, Festus replaces him, he goes up to Jerusalem, he hears that Paul is a very, very bad man, 
Uh, that's in Acts 25, verses 1 through 3. He stays in Jerusalem for a time. Then he goes to Caesarea, where Paul's being held, and uh, he conducts a trial. And that was what we saw last week as well, the second trial. Uh, at this trial, the Jews come, and this time they're a little bit different in their accusations against him. Uh, and um, basically, Festus determines that um, they have no argument that he's done anything wrong. It, it's, it's an issue of their religion. That's what he says is in verse 7 and 8. But Festus is new on the scene. He's a new governor, and he wants to appease the Jews so they don't cause all sorts of issues. So he keeps Paul in prison rather than letting him go. Um, I think Paul kind of continually senses this delay tactic from the governors. And so we saw at the end of our text last week and 25 uh, verse 12, Paul ultimately says, fine, I want to plead my case to Caesar. I want to plead my case to the emperor, which was the right of every Roman citizen. And so Paul does make that request. And Festus now has to respond to Paul's request. So that's where we're picking up. Um, Paul has just delivered this, and Festus has said, you appeal to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. So let's go ahead and read Acts 25, 13 to 22, and we're going to pick up from there. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And they stayed there many days. Festus laid out Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a man left prisoner by Felix, and when I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders and the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give anyone, uh, up anyone before the accused met his accusers face to face and had an opportunity to make a defense concerning the charges laid against him. Verse 17. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day I took my seat on the tribunal and ordered a man to be brought, uh, the man to be brought. When the accuser stood up, they brought no charge of his case, of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points to dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserts to be alive. Being at a loss of how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem to be tried there regarding them. But when Paul appealed to be kept in the custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar." So here's, here's kind of the lowdown of what's going on. We've got uh, a couple of individuals come on the scene. Now, we learned a little bit about Festus last time, um, but now we have a new particular person on the scene, and it's Agrippa the king. Now, Agrippa is actually King Agrippa II, son of King Agrippa I, for those of you who are trying to keep track of the kings. It's a lot of work because they keep getting replaced and killed. It's kind of a lot of work. Um, he was educated specifically in Rome, and he stayed there until his uncle, who ruled basically the land around, died. Uh, following his uncle's death, Agrippa II was appointed by the emperor Claudius as king over this province of Syria. He was also given control over the temple of Jerusalem with the right of appointing the high priest. And so he ruled from Palestine from about 8048 until about 8092, one of the longest ruling kings during the first century. Um, and so, uh, after Jose according to Josephus, after the death of Herod, this, basically, Claudius presented his kingdom to the nephew, Agrippa, the son of Agrippa. And so, that's what we have here. The other person that's mentioned here, and it's kind of mentioned almost offhandedly, you'll notice a lady's name by the name of Bernice. Now, to us, we're like, why? King Agrippa, we get that. He's in control of the whole province of Syria. But Bernice? Like... Oh, and Bernice, of course. Everybody knows who Bernice is. Like, um, and it's, it's weird to us because we look at him and go, what, what, what's with this? Well, actually, Bernice is the older sister of Drusilla, who's the wife of Felix. So Felix's wife is older sister. Now, Felix has been removed, but his wife's sister is now with Agrippa I. And according to Josephus, when Agrippa I died, he was survived by his wife, Cypros, and his three daughters, Bernice being one of them. Now, Bernice married her uncle, because that was okay in those days. And uh, so she married her uncle, and when he died, she then moved in and lived with her brother uh, Agrippa, which is the King Agrippa here. Now, unfortunately, um, in Roman society, this was seen as a little bit of faux pas, 
And there were a lot of questions around her and who she was and what she was doing living with her brother. There were some incestual relationships accused, all sorts of nasty uh, accusations against her in the first century. And there's actually a fair amount of work written um, that we have today about Bernice uh, from the first century. Uh, they made plays about her and made jokes about her, and she was not well thought of in the first century. So it's interesting that Luke makes a note, Bernice was there as well. She would have been well known. She would have been well known. So we have, we have two individuals that have been well known throughout the entire empire, uh, but more specifically, they'd be really well known in Syria, and they're now in the scene that we have. Now, what happens in verses 13 and following is this interchange between a couple of Romans. And the question is, how did Luke find out about that? Right? I mean, if you think about it, I mean, Luke's, Luke's writing, he's writing post the events, and he's saying, here are the things that took place to Theophilus. And so he must have had some sort of conversation with some of the individuals that were present. We don't know who but someone who is present, and he tells kind of a summary of what is said. So Festus brings the case of Paul to Agrippa in verse 14. Uh, he, he lays Paul's case before the king. Now, uh, you may wonder, why is Festus bringing this to the king? He's already appealed to Caesar. Paul's already appealed to Caesar. Like, you know, why, why, why go to the next level up, right? Well, part of this is because Festus is new. He's a new governor, and he doesn't want to overstep the king, right? And so he, he wants to make sure that before he sends Paul on to Caesar, that at least King Agrippa is in the know, because if you know anything about hierarchy and order, you don't skip. <laughs> People get a little upset, and all of a sudden, off with your head kind of thing. So, um, so he wants to make sure Agrippa knows, but it's not just that. Agrippa is actually really well known in the Jewish community, and it's believed that he knew their prophets, their, their, their law. He knew all of those things. He had been in Syria for so long that he knew it better than anybody else in Rome. And so he's kind of seen as an expert on the Jewish religion by everyone in Rome. And so probably as Festus is getting the situation, finds out that the issue with Paul is not necessarily Roman law, but this Jewish religious stuff. He probably wants to have King Agrippa weigh in to help him out. And that's specifically what we see is he seems to be asking questions of Agrippa so that he might know how to respond to the emperor. Now, when Paul appeals to the emperor, he appeals to Emperor Nero. I don't know if you've ever heard of that fabulous man. Um, but uh, he was known for killing Christians. That was the thing that he became known for. Not at this point, but at some point near in the future. Uh, and he was very wicked. Uh, right now, his mom is still kind of in control of the empire, and there was all sorts of jokes about that being made at the time. Uh, but after his mom is, is banished uh, from the Roman Empire, Emperor Nero kind of starts making some trouble across all of Rome uh, and ultimately gets himself killed at some point in the future, but not before he kills tons of Christians. So Paul's appealing to Nero, and Emperor Nero's fairly new on the scene, and before everything gets sent to him, uh, Festus wants to make sure that he's got his case laid out properly. So in verses 14 to 21, Luke deals details for us specifically this conversation between Festus and Agrippa. Um, and the biggest question for them is regarding this way. Um, and we talked about Christianity. Christianity isn't known as Christianity very much, but except for twice in the New Testament. More often it's referred to as the way. Uh, which we've talked about before. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christians taught the way, uh, being Jesus. And so uh, he specifically says, look, I, I met these guys. They don't have any problem with our laws. And in fact, the issue is something related to a Jewish understanding. And so um, verse, I think, uh, let's see, uh, look back down through it again. Uh, verse 19, I think, is very interesting. So Festus gets enough of the information from the trial he has to say they had certain points of dispute with Paul about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. This is the crux of the difference between what Paul was teaching and what the Jews were teaching. That Jesus was the Messiah, that he died, everybody agrees with that, but that he 
asserted that Jesus is actually alive. And, and this is the assertion of, of what makes ultimately the call the difference between what the Jews were trying to propagate and ultimately what the Christians were saying is that Jesus is the Messiah. He fulfills the law and the prophets. And by his death, we are made to have life. And he is raised to a new life just like we will be. And so, um, obviously, for Festus, he comes in and he's like, what is all of this with people dying and coming back to life? And, this, you know, I don't know anything about this Jewish religion. And, you know, King Agrippa, please, please help me. Now, I think it's interesting um, that when we look at the text, this is very similar to what we see um, Jesus ultimately declaring as well. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. For those who enter by it are many, but the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and few that find it. The reality is, is this message of Jesus dying and then being brought back to life is a message that's going to become difficult as we're going to see in the text this morning. People are going to stumble over this idea and they're going to go, but people don't come back from the dead. And the reality is, is that it did happen. Paul asserted that it happened and that this is the foundation of our faith that we hold today. That Jesus wasn't just a man, but that, in fact, he was the Lord of creation. He died and is now alive, and it happened then, and it still is true today. Jesus is still alive today. So verse 20, Festus says, I'm, I'm at a loss for how to investigate these questions. I have no, I have no idea what to do here, uh, so I need, I need your help. Um, and so we get into Acts chapter 25, starting in verse 22, where Agrippa then kind of talks to Festus. Now, what's going to happen here is a semi-courtroom drama. Uh, I think it's primarily because they didn't have Law and Order reruns. So they had to come up with something to do. Um, because what you're going to see in the text is that there is just this great big party that they're going to throw, and Paul's going to be the spectacle of the party. And they're going to kind of all decide together whether or not Paul is what his case is. So just watch. Listen. Starting in verse 22. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. Verse 23. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the, pronounced, and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any, any longer. But I have found that he's done nothing deserving of death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seemed to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. Now, I like how the Greek specifically says with great prompt. You'll notice every translation, no matter what translation you're reading out of this morning, almost unilaterally, they all say the same thing, great pomp. And it's a great way of describing it because it's, it's basically implying a cheap display of high status. It's basically what it is. You know, I don't know whether they were blowing horns or whether there was just this massive festival, but can you, can you envision this? A bunch of really rich people gathering together and putting on an elegant, you know, extravagant but cheap party around this guy, Paul, who's been accused of a crime. <laughs> this is not the thing you party for, but apparently you didn't have much to do in the first century. So. But, but notice, verse 23 says, with military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. This is a, this is a big gathering. Bernice is here, King Agrippa's here, Festus is here, and all the prominent men of the city, all the tribunes, the military tribunes, everyone's here. It's a big, it's a big to do. I love how Festus says, you will see, the, you see the man. Paul's standing in the midst of this group. They've got this big, huge party going on. I could imagine there's probably good catering going on. You know, they're probably eating food. 
right? And uh, so they're all sitting back, and they, you know, Festus parades Paul up in front of everybody and says, you see him? This is the guy. This is the guy that all that big deal is about. And um, I, I think it's interesting because uh, Festus says, I have nothing definite to write to my Lord. That's referring to the emperor. Festus is like, I don't even know what to write about this guy. Like, I don't, <laughs> uh, you guys need to help me come up with what the issue is and what the problem is so that when I write it down to the emperor, he has an idea of what's going on. Now, uh, what I think is so interesting is he's basically encouraging every single person to pay attention to put Paul on trial, in a sense. And I don't know if like, this is the very first group project like in recorded history where Festus just doesn't like doing the group project, and so he's like, let's do it a group project, and I'll have everybody else do my work for me. I, I don't know if that's what this is, like cheating. I, I don't know. Um, but he makes a big show of Paul. He includes all these officials as part of the jury and the judges of Paul's case. Uh, it, Paul's in front of the assembly, now, it, I think about it this way. If I, if I called someone up here and said something like what Festus just did, would you be paying attention to what they had to say? And that's, you guys are all gathered here this morning. Right? But if I was just like, hey, you, come up here. And this is what's going, this is, someone's been accused of all these things. Now, let's, let's, let's all evaluate what he's saying and, and let's figure out something to write to the emperor. Now, having something wrote to the emperor is a big deal. And uh, you want credit. <laughs> Yeah, I have something to say. I can just envision this crowd of people waiting to kind of, okay, what, do, what am I going to say that's going to get on the, the letter to the emperor? It's significant. These individuals want to be seen as a, in a positive light. They're looking for an opportunity to have Festus like them, the new emperor. And King Agrippa's here, and so they're like, oh, we want to make a good impression with him, too. You know, they could start rising in the Roman ranks. Right, so everyone's here to try to make a good impression. They want, they want, so they're going to be attentive. They're going to be paying attention. Now, who's with Paul? Do you notice in the text? Anybody? Anybody with Paul? Nope. He's alone. By himself. Large group of people. High officials. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity to meet a famous person. A famous person. I use that in quotations, but... I, some, there's something about sometimes when you meet a famous person, like there's this almost like, oh, hi, I saw you on TV. Uh, there's this element that, I don't know about you, but, but I feel that way, right? And so there's this, there's this element that sometimes you're tempted to change how you might interact. Now, Paul is before every major official in the providences that he's lived in. I'm sure there's a small temptation to appeal to them in a way that they'll like him. Maybe even subvert the message a little. Ultimately, no matter how you feel, it's difficult to stand in front of a group of people who are deemed important by society and present anything. <laughs> um, so I think about that with Paul. Paul. And the reality is, is Paul isn't alone, because in Mark chapter 13, 9 through 11, Jesus says, but be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you'll be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel first must be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand for what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. The reality is that Jesus is present. He has not forsaken his apostle. He is present by the Spirit to deliver exactly the message that God intends in this moment and in this place. And just for a moment, I have to speak to the providence of God over everything, especially over the kings of the earth. Think about for a moment what God has done in this text. He has brought the group of individuals that are present together for one purpose, to hear the gospel. That's what it is. This is the opportunity that God is using Paul to communicate the gospel where they all want to listen to what he has to say. And they're all evaluating what is he saying and what is true. And they're asking questions about, not just with vague interests, but really attempting to judge what Paul is saying. And is it true? This reminds me of what another king said in regards to the Lord. 
In Daniel chapter 4, verses 34, 35, and 37, it, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say, stay his hand, or say to him, what have you done? Nebuchadnezzar continues in verse 37 of the same chapter. He says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right, his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. That is the kind of God we serve. The kind of God that ultimately Nebuchadnezzar recognized through providence and through miraculous action that God is the only one who none can stand against. Likewise, that the Lord moves and acts however he wills. And here in Acts chapter 25, the Lord has made a way for the gospel to be given to the governors, to the men of prominence, to the tribunes, and to all of the regional men of, of, of value. What an amazing opportunity this mock court scene is for the gospel. There's no way Paul could have created this. There's really no way that Paul could have created this scenario. But God did this, and he certainly did, and he still continues to do these kind of things today. And you, you need to understand that if God can providentially make this work, whatever your circumstances are, he can providentially work through those. He can handle whatever those circumstances are. And you might not know how it's all going to work out, but he does, and he has it planned out. And we just need to trust in him. We talked about this a little bit last week, but I have to bring it up again. Part of the key for the situation for Paul to be where he is is that Paul, by the grace of God, has acted in a manner worthy of the gospel to this point. Paul has done nothing wrong. If they had something to accuse him against, if they had something legitimate that they could stick to his account, he would have been dead. But the point is, and it was repeated over and over again by all of the Roman leaders, this man's done nothing worthy of death. This man's done nothing wrong. We, too, need to make sure that we are living out our lives in such a way that when the world looks at us, they say, they haven't done anything worthy of death. They haven't done anything wrong against me. And when we do fail, we do make mistakes, we, we acknowledge those mistakes like Paul did. We saw that a couple weeks ago. That no one can bring a credible crime against us. And that being said, I think we live in an era where church leaders ultimately bring about cries of hypocrisy to the church. That ultimately we're living in a time right now, unfortunately, where we could look at different churches and different places around the globe and say, look, there's a church leader who's, who's in active sin, and the whole world is coming against them. And then they're using those coupled examples to say, see, the church is full of hypocrites and fakes. The reality is, is it's that your lives, when you leave here and go home, if you profess to be a Christian, your bearing of the fruit of works that are from repentance are going to prove that false. And then we can look to those people who are not performing the works and say, Jesus has spoken of them. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. He says, You will recognize them by their fruits. He says, Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But diseased trees bear bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Jesus goes on to say that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. It doesn't mean that we can't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that we're not going to fail. And it doesn't mean that sometimes we're going to do something that's wrong. But the habit of our lives should be good fruit, not bad fruit. And if you continue to produce bad fruit, the reality according to the scriptures is it's, it's that you're a bad tree. It's that what you make claims about yourself is not true. You claim to be a tree that has the wellspring of life, the water of life of Christ, 
but you're producing death. Your faith and repentance may only be words and not genuine. And that's what Jesus gives very strict warnings about. He goes on to that passage to say, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and I will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Bad fruit. So Paul's produced good fruit, which brings him to this situation. Chapter 26. So, we have this perfect situation where Paul's been set up. Chapter 26, we're reading verse 1 through 11. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that as before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by the Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem, not only locking up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul starts off with a little bit of a flourish. He raises his hand. He demonstrates that he's a good order. And that's what everyone would have understood. He begins speaking, and they already had attention towards him because they've been given a reason to listen. But now he, he begins delivering a message, and they're ready to listen because they can see He's used to preaching. <laughs> He's well-spoken. He's not just a simple common Roman citizen who's also a Jew who happened to get caught up in a controversy. He's well-spoken. He addresses King Agrippa respectfully. Do you notice that, respectfully? Oh, we, we talked about this last week. I'm going to mention it again. We are to be respectful to our leaders, even when we disagree with them. Agrippa, again, was not the greatest of guys. But Paul respectfully handles him, as should we. And as we should to all who have positions that God has given them. Doesn't mean we can't disagree. Just means we have to disagree respectfully. So verse 5, I think, is very interesting. Paul makes a comment that they have known for a long time if they are willing to testify... The Jews have known who Paul is, they know what Paul thinks, they know what he believes, and they've constantly misrepresented him for the purpose of trying to get him killed. And so what's happening here is he's saying, look, if they would be willing to represent me properly, they would be able to testify to you the very same things I'm telling you. This is known by all of them. Then he continues, verse 5, and he says that he is the strictest party of our religion. Our religion. Paul is saying, I'm a Jew and I believe in Judaism. Apart from something that's been going on in society today, and this is, this is starting to permeate the church, and I have to tell you, Christianity is a Jewish religion. We... we the Old Testament isn't the Old Testament as in we don't have to look at it anymore. And there are pastors that are prominent that are speaking now and saying, well, the old stuff, it's old, and we just handle the new. And we don't need to go back there and look at it. And that is false. That is untrue. The reality is, is that the God of the Bible has been declaring the message from the beginning, and if you don't have the Old Testament, you don't understand the new. 
Paul refers to both in verse 6 and 7 the hope that the Jews are hoping in. It's something that was declared by the prophets and by Moses. I don't understand preachers that say, well, we'll just read the New Testament and we'll leave the rest of it alone. I don't know how you handle the New Testament without quoting the Old Testament because the New Testament authors do it all the time. So does Jesus. Things like unhitching the Old Testament and getting rid of the baggage that's in the Old Testament are unacceptable statements. The reality is, is that what is in the Old Testament is true just as much as the new. Paul ultimately points to what are the Jews hoping for? Verse 7, he says, and for the hope, for this hope, what hope? What hope? The hope, verse 9, is that God raises the dead. The Sadducees come against Jesus and they say, Jesus, you know, there is no resurrection. Prove it. Uh Uh-huh. And Jesus says, have you not read? God is the God of Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, present tense. Those people didn't cease to exist. They still exist. The reality is, is there is a hope for the resurrection. That is the hope of the Jews. That is the hope of the Christians. The difference between the Jews is that we actually have an example of what it's going to be. Because Christ was raised. Paul then, in verses 9 through 11, details his opposition of the Christians. He says, I tried to make them blaspheme. This has been a regular occurrence throughout church history. Listen to Plenty the Younger. This is uh, him writing 80, 61 to 112. He says, an example of how Plenty dealt with Christians when he was sent to Bethlehem and Pontius by Trajan. In his correspondence to Trajan, describing the effect of how he forced Christians to blaspheme by denying their faith. This is him in the quote. For the moment, this is the line I have taken with all persons brought before me on the charge of being Christians. I have asked them in person if they are Christians. And if they admit it, I repeat the question a second and a third time with a warning of punishment awaiting them. If they persist, I order them to be led away to execution. For those who have, been, who have denied being Christians, plenty forced them to repeat after him this formula. It's a formula of invocation to the gods and had made offerings of wine and incense to your statue and furthermore reviled the name of Christ. And he says, none of these things which I understand any genuine Christian can be induced to do. That's writing in the first century. Reality is, is getting Christians to deny the name of Christ has been what every leader that's come against Christians have tried to get them to do. Why? Because it's in him that we have the hope of the resurrection. So Paul continues in verse 12. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and all those who journeyed with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to anoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen in me and those I will appear in you, delivering you from your people, Uh, from your people and from the Gentiles, whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those things in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, then throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles." that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and to great, saying nothing but what the prophets and the Moses would have come to pass, that Jesus, that the Christ, must suffer, and that by the first and being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both our people 
and to the Gentiles. That's a powerful message. Paul says, I, I've not been disobedient. I had this vision. We've talked about this multiple times. It's come up multiple times in the book of Acts. This conversion experience that Paul has. And Paul recognizes in verse 22 that the testimony that he gives is not just to those who are small, but to those who are great. And the testimony he's giving actively right now is because of the help of God. That without the help of God, he wouldn't be where he is at this moment testifying to what he has testified. Paul bases his message on the facts of the prophets and Moses. That's the basis of his message. It has to be the basis of ours. The reality is, is verse 23 says something very interesting. That the Christ must suffer and being the first to rise from the dead, that he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. There is this, there's this element to which we see that the gospel is going to go first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. But the reality is, is this message of people rising from the dead and specifically Christ rising from the dead, this is, this is illogical. Turn with me, if you will, 1 Corinthians. Right after Romans, you get 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 1. And I'm going to read just a few verses, 18 to 25. This is Paul writing to those in Corinth long before his testimony here before Agrippa. He says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Verse 20, chapter 1. Where there is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That's what we've got going on here. Paul is declaring the message of the gospel. And what we are about to witness is exactly what Paul tells the Corinthians. Is... It, be, it comes viewed as folly. It becomes viewed as madness. This is crazy what you're talking about. This doesn't make any sense. Let's look at verse 24 of chapter 26. If you turn back to Acts. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus with a loud voice declared, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about the things that I, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. Look at what Paul does, verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time would you persuade me to become a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as am I, except for these chains. And the king rose, and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free had he not appealed to Caesar. So the word here in the Greek on chapter 20, or verse 24, what Festus says, he says, you're this mania. Uh, not maniac, but mania. Uh, so he's, he's saying you're completely out of your mind. What you're saying is ridiculous. Festus argues that Paul is now in madness due to his great learning. Now what's interesting is, is that just a few chapters before, in Acts chapter 16, the Athenians argued that Paul was ignorant, Right? And so the Athenians are saying Paul's ignorant, and now Festus is saying, Paul, you're just so smart, like you've you've gone mad. And the reality is that the message of the gospel brings people to the point of absurdity in order to reject it. Many times when I'm discussing with somebody the the, the nature of the gospel, and we're maybe having a a, a kind and and well-worded debate, 
they might say, oh, well, you know, I have some reasons why I don't believe the gospel. And we start, we start going through those, and I start demonstrating the evidence of the gospel and the truth of the scriptures and demonstrate the truth of the resurrection of Christ. And, and they go, well, well, that's all good. And they keep bringing up more objections. And finally, I look at them, and I'll go, after about three or four objections, I go, well, how about this? How about you tell me what you would need in order to change your mind and believe what the Bible says about God and choose to worship him? I will tell you that every time I've had that conversation with someone that's given me that many objections, they've said, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can show me. There's nothing you can tell me. I won't worship that God no matter what. The reality is, is you can bring someone to the point of absurdity and they will still choose to reject the gospel because they don't want it to be true. The reality is, is, Here we have another objection to the gospel. But Paul says in verse 25, he says, I'm not out of my mind. I'm speaking true and rational words. The reality is that the gospel is true and it's rational. That doesn't mean that that I can reason somebody to it because like we read in Corinthians, it's folly. It's only understand by spiritual. God has to enlighten the mind to understand the truth of the gospel. However, the reality is it is true and it's rational. Paul also says it's not been done in a corner. The gospel and the work of Christ and his church should not be and is not done in a corner. And for those of us who are tempted to hide our Christianity from others, we've missed the point. The reality is, is that our Christian lives should be demonstrated throughout the communities that we're in and in the circles we're in and in our families. And as difficult as that is sometimes, we need to demonstrate the life of Christ in our personal lives, in the work that God is doing in us. Not in an obnoxious way, but in a true way. Paul ultimately puts Agrippa on the spot and says, do you believe? And Agrippa kind of (laughs) backpedals. Uh, I'm not going to make any commitments here in front of everybody. <laughs> Paul knew what he was doing. But the reality is the question does need to be asked to you. Do you believe? Do you believe the gospel? Do you believe what has been revealed in scriptures? Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Looking back, verse 18 says, The gospel is aimed at opening their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's what Jesus said to Paul. The gospel results are following, the turning from darkness to light, a turning from the power of Satan to God, forgiveness of your sins, and ultimately a place among those who are sanctified in faith, by faith in Christ. You have a place. You have a belonging. Christ has made you belong. Acts 26, 20, we're going to end here looking at what it says specifically. Paul says that he's delivering the message throughout the regions of Judea, Damascus, Jerusalem, also to the Gentiles. Notice what Paul says they should do, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. The gospel is not just, I think it, I agree with it. Repentance is changing your way of thinking and your attitude towards being in agreement with. Turning is to change one's belief, to come to an acceptance of the truth regarding God and what he has said. The direction of the repentance and the direction of the turning is towards God, not towards something else. And the last thing that Paul mentions there is performing deeds, that's carrying out actions, work, tasks, that are proper and fitting to the repentance. If you don't have all three of those things this morning, then you don't fully have the gospel. If you just make a mental ascent of, yeah, there's a God up there, and I come to church occasionally. That's not the gospel. The gospel is changing your way of thinking, agreeing with God about yourself and about him. It's changing your beliefs about him, and it's performing deeds that are carrying on the work. Now, we, we don't do the work. It's not a workspace salvation. It's in faith. We do it by faith. 
But that faith results, as James tells us, in works. And that if your faith never results in works, then you have to ask the question that James asked, can that faith save you? Because faith that saves results in fruit from good trees. So, if you do have the proper understanding of the gospel, the question is next is, are you actively pursuing the gospel every day? Are you actively testifying to the gospel every day? Have you thought about setting up what would I do in a situation like this? Now, certainly I said that the Holy Spirit will give the words. That's what Jesus says. But that doesn't mean there isn't value in saying, hey, you know what, God, when you give me an opportunity to talk to that person at the supermarket, here's what I'm going to say. When you give me an opportunity to talk to that person and my family, here here are some of the things that I want to bring up. Have you thought about that? Taking five minutes just to think about what might you share about what God has done in your life? If you've not thought about it, it's going to be really hard to do it in the moment. God can use your preparation. So, my call for you today, repent and believe the gospel. That's something that I have to do even today. Because we like sheep, we go astray. We come back to him, the savior of our souls. And I need to continually aim at testifying to the truth of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful for Paul. I'm thankful for the message that he shared with these great cloud of people. And Father, I I thank you that you have given him the boldness by your spirit to communicate the message of the gospel. I pray that you would work in us a knowledge and understanding and a belief in the gospel, that your spirit would work in that in every single life of every person here. And Father, that more than that, that 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 knowledge and that that turning away from self and towards you and and beginning to perform the works uh, that is in accordance with that gospel, that in that they would be testifying, that each of us would be testifying to what you have done and the fact that you have risen and that we have a hope. Pray that that would be true of every member here and that as we go out that we would impact our community with the gospel. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Worship team. If we could all stand, we're going to sing one more song called Christ Our Hope in Life and Death.
<laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have had together, for the songs that we have lifted up to you, for the words from your word that have been shared with us. Father, it is our hope that we will leave here different than when we came in that we will be a changed people because we have had an encounter with you. And that that encounter we will share with those around us that others may know who you are and what you have done for us as a people. Father, we pray your protection over us as we go our separate ways until we can meet again. And all of this we pray in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a wonderful week.